This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everyone. Um, so we're excited to welcome Sadia Khan this morning uh, to give us Grand Rounds presentation. So far, she is a Northwestern lifer, having completed medical school residency and fellowship at Northwestern. Um, during her tenure, she served as chief resident as well as chief fellow. Currently, she's faculty in the Department of Preventive Medicine, and she's had an incredible amount of success in topic areas, including heart failure prediction, which seems like it's novel, although it shouldn't be, um, as well as maternal morbidity and mortality related to cardiovascular disease. She's got almost 150 publications and multiple funded grants. Sadia, we're excited to welcome you and learn from you this morning. Thank you so much for the kind invitation. You missed college as well at Northwestern. So um, I bleed purple as you will see. But um, joking aside, it's really a pleasure to be here in much warmer weather um, and to be able to have a chance to chat with folks and talk a little bit about cardiovascular health in the peripartum period. We'll start with a clinical case. This is a young woman that I saw in the emergency room a couple of years ago. She had come in after an uncomplicated delivery with shortness of breath five days postpartum. She was hypertensive on examination and volume overloaded. As you can see from her chest radiograph, her BNP was elevated, her troponin in the pre-high sensitivity era was elevated at 2.5. Her echocardiogram showed overall preserved left ventricular ejection fraction, but there was some inferolateral hypokinesis and mild left ventricular hypertrophy. So overall, this was a pretty typical presentation of postpartum preeclampsia with some overlap with question of wall motion abnormalities, potentially under the stress of hypertension, which did normalize after her blood pressure normalized. But given this, what should we counsel her on her short and long-term risk of cardiovascular disease? And what evidence-based strategies exist in the postpartum period or do we need to reduce her risk of cardiovascular disease? So over the next 40 minutes or so, we're gonna talk through these three key objectives and hopefully try to address that and identify the key knowledge gaps that we need to fill, particularly relevant to us as cardiologists in this field. First, define the peripartum period as a critical life period for cardiovascular risk in birthing individuals. Second, describe the evolving epidemiology of adverse pregnancy outcomes and potential drivers of these trends. And third, discuss the rationale for cardiovascular health promotion and identify opportunities to intervene in the peripartum period. So let's get started with this overall schematic. If we think about the life course and specifically zero in on the reproductive years, we know that this is demarcated by the beginning of the reproductive years by menarche and concludes with menopause and may be interjected with one or more pregnancies. Particularly during that pregnancy period, we know that there is significant risk for short-term maternal morbidity and mortality that may be cardiovascular in nature, specifically adverse pregnancy outcomes and cardiovascular disease, which account for a third of complications of maternal mortality. We also now know that these pregnancy complications are associated with long-term risk for cardiovascular disease that we'll review the data for. This schematic in terms of defining pregnancy as nature stress test is one that has emerged over the last decade, identifying traditional risk factors as well as pregnancy related risk factors that are associated with risk of adverse pregnancy outcomes, specifically hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, which encompass preeclampsia, gestational hypertension, as well as other cardiometabolic complications like gestational diabetes, preterm birth for the gestational age of 37 weeks and small for gestational age. Each of these have independently been associated with overt cardiovascular disease in long-term studies. So some of that data comes from observational epidemiologic cohorts like the UK Biobank. This is an analysis that was published a few years ago that looked at over 200,000 women in the UK Biobank, of which about 1% self-reported hypertensive disorders of pregnancy in midlife and were then followed. Those who reported hypertensive disorders of pregnancy had a much higher risk for a variety of cardiovascular disease subtypes including coronary artery disease, heart failure, aortic stenosis, and mitral regurgitation. One of the potential hypotheses about why this may be so is that hypertensive disorders of pregnancy specifically, and maybe even the spectrum of adverse pregnancy outcomes, may reflect an accelerated aging phenotype. And if there's accelerated vascular aging, for example, we may see manifestations in a variety of cardiovascular disease subtypes. 
Importantly, the study also looked at cardiovascular risk factors after the adverse pregnancy outcome and identified that nearly half of the risk from the adverse pregnancy outcome hypertensive disorders of pregnancy in this study was mediated through chronic hypertension, identifying a key target for prevention following pregnancy. In a, another analysis from the Women's Health Initiative, this study asked more specifically heart failure, the association between hypertensive disorders of pregnancy and heart failure. Knowing that heart failure is a very heterogeneous condition, the identification or diagnosis of heart failure alone doesn't necessarily help us better understand the pathophysiology of where this link may come from. And so specifically ask the question, are there differences in this association between heart failure subtypes? And indeed they are. In the Women's Health Initiative, about 10,000 women were surveyed about a prior history of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, of which about 7% reported either preeclampsia or gestational hypertension across their lifetime. Now, the association with heart failure was primarily driven by heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, as you see here, and there was no association with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, which may suggest that mechanisms related to this relationship, such as endothelial dysfunction or coronary microvascular dysfunction, may predispose to this specific type of heart failure. Again, this association was largely mediated by traditional risk factors, re-emphasizing the importance of primary prevention of cardiovascular disease among individuals who have experienced an adverse pregnancy outcome. So if we know that adverse pregnancy outcomes are associated with cardiovascular disease, we need to get a better understanding of the pathway of how individuals get there and better dissecting the subclinical cardiovascular disease features that may be experienced by individuals to understand that pathway as well as mechanisms are important. Now, I mentioned that cardiovascular disease risk factors, particularly hypertension following hypertensive disorders or pregnancy, seems to be a key pathway through which individuals who experience elevated blood pressures during pregnancy go on to have cardiovascular disease. But what about other markers of subclinical cardiovascular disease, such as atherosclerosis or abnormal cardiac mechanics? This is important to understand because if we know how to detect these abnormal pathways or the pathway through which this occurs, then we may be able to detect, screen, and prevent disease. So these are two cross-sectional studies that are in the literature that demonstrate the elevated risk of subclinical atherosclerosis after a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy. Both of these studies are cross-sectional and from Europe. The first one here, the Cardiovascular Risk Profile Imaging and Gender Specific Disorder Study, recruited about 258 women that were in midlife, aged 40 to 63, and had a history of preeclampsia, and compared them with age and sex matched with um, individuals from the Framingham Health Study. They identified that CAC was more prevalent at about 20%, so any coronary artery calcium, compared with 13% among women who had preeclampsia. Now, the other thing in the study that they looked at was, was the burden of CAC similar across age groups. And what they identified was that among women with preeclampsia, it appeared that CAC started about five years earlier. So again, supporting this aging hypothesis potentially, where we're seeing the onset of disease, not only higher risk, but earlier onset. In the second study here, the Copenhagen Preeclampsia and Cardiovascular Disease Study, they recruited 1,400 women from Copenhagen, about 700 with preeclampsia and 700 without, and performed CTA. So looking for any coronary atherosclerosis, really commenting on the fact that coronary calcium is a later marker of atherosclerosis. And oftentimes, particularly for younger women, even in their 40s, we may not detect coronary calcium, but athero or even um, or significant athero or even minimal athero that might be there may be relevant and a marker of evolving disease. And in this study, again, there was a higher burden of subclinical atherosclerosis at 27% among women who had preeclampsia compared with 20%. So that tells us a little bit about the atheropathways. What about myocardial remodeling? 
we know that individuals in the short term who have hypertensive disorders of pregnancy have adverse cardiac remodeling. But what about long-term after the pregnancy? This is one study out of Pitt that looked at individuals who had hypertensive disorders of pregnancy and those who didn't and performed echocardiogram eight to 10 years after delivery. So it was a smaller study, about 132 women of which 23% um, had hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. And about 10 years post-delivery, they grouped people as individuals who had a normal tense of pregnancy and did not currently have hypertension, those who had either elevated blood pressure during pregnancy or had hypertension, and then the combination who had had hypertensive disorders of pregnancy and now had hypertension. And as you can see, the gradation across the bottom there, those individuals who had hypertensive disorders of pregnancy and had chronic hypertension now had higher interventricular septal wall thickness, LV wall remodeling, and worse diastolic function. Interestingly, whether there was elevated blood pressure during pregnancy or chronic hypertension at the time of the echo measurement, there were similar findings on echo, suggesting that the underlying um, ev evolution of cardiovascular disease following the elevated blood pressure in pregnancy is very similar to what we see for traditional risk factors. Now, this matters because we're talking about cardiovascular risk after the adverse pregnancy outcome, but we know that pre-existing cardiovascular disease risk factors, such as abnormal blood pressure before pregnancy, elevated BMI, or other risk factors can actually lead into pregnancy with impaired placentation or risk for adverse pregnancy outcomes. So the schematic shown here about the potential for why this cardiac dysfunction may persist after pregnancy is, I think, really helpful to start to understand what are the mechanisms that may be contributing to this. So if there's higher levels of oxidative stress pre-pregnancy, and that is then accelerated or exacerbated during pregnancy, um, whereas in a normal pregnancy, we see some physiologic changes, but that returns to baseline postpartum. We don't see that same recovery in individuals who have risk coming in or who experience adverse pregnancy outcomes. I think this still continues to be a, question, a key question in this area. And this is a schematic that was published now about 20 years ago that was starting to try to understand what is the difference between an individual who experiences the normal stress of pregnancy where we know there is a physiologic stressor in that blue dashed line and then returns back to normal or near normal, their baseline postpartum. And you can see over time as people develop into middle age, their vascular risk factors increase over time. But in the population with complicated pregnancy like preeclampsia is what we're seeing that the stress of pregnancy leads to an exaggerated response that leads to a pathophysiologic response or manifestation of disease like hypertensive disorder of pregnancy. And then they return back to the trajectory they were at, or they end up at a different trajectory. And this really starts to ask the question, are adverse pregnancy outcomes just unmasking risk that already existed? Are they a marker? Or are they a mediator of that risk itself and are accelerating the disease process? And thereby, the difference in understanding this, I think, gives us more need to prevent adverse pregnancy outcomes and move earlier in the life course if we want to alter this trajectory versus identifying them and prioritizing prevention following their identification. So how can we better understand this question? And this is one of the questions of one of our current funded projects in the new mom-to-be heart health study, which is an NICHD and HLBI funded cohort that recruited about 10,000 pregnant people about 10 years ago from eight sites in the United States who have now been followed and are coming back for an in-person exam where we're going to be doing carotid IMT measurements on them. We wanted to ask if we think about the most common risk factor coming into pregnancy, it's probably obesity. And in this sample, about 25% of women before their first pregnancy at a mean age of 25 had obesity. And if we look at the relationship between BMI and adverse pregnancy outcomes and postpartum risk factors like hypertension, you know, in the five to seven year period after pregnancy, we know that these relationships exist. BMI is a very strong predictor of adverse pregnancy outcomes, including hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, and it's a very strong and robust predictor of going on to have hypertension afterwards. But is it truly 
is, uh, is hypertensive disorder truly a mediator in that relationship? Or is it just a marker where it's unmasking that risk coming into pregnancy? And so in order to ask that question, we looked at the 4,000 individuals in the new mom to be heart health study that were enrolled at a gestational age of 11%. And as mentioned, about 22% had obesity and 15% had new onset hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, which included preeclampsia and gestational hypertension. And we set up this mediation analysis to ask that question specifically. And you can see here, for example, for systolic blood pressure at that five to seven year postpartum period, there are um, four values here in the table that we'll walk through. The first is the total effect. This is not surprising, right? That there's a relationship between um, BMI or obesity and systolic blood pressure postpartum. So those individuals who had obesity had a three millimeter higher um, blood pressure postpartum. So that's that total effect that we see whether or not someone had an adverse pregnancy outcome. The second um, column is the direct effect. So if we remove the adverse pregnancy outcome and say individuals who didn't have an adverse pregnancy outcome, what was the relationship between the two? And we see that's about 2.5 millimeters of mercury. So the mediated amount of blood pressure through obesity is about 0.7 or proportionally about 22%. So this suggests that the um, occurrence of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy is not just unmasking the risk, but has its own contribution to future risk in terms of systolic blood pressure or the evolution of cardiovascular risk. Now it's a minority of that risk, but still a meaningful and important aspect of that. We also looked at some of the other risk factors that were measured at that time and saw similar patterns for diastolic blood pressure, total cholesterol and triglycerides. We did not see any relationship for fasting glucose specifically for hypertensive disorders or pregnancy. But when we looked at gestational diabetes, which as you can imagine, we did see a significant mediation for fasting glucose. So now that I've convinced you there's a strong association between adverse pregnancy outcomes, cardiovascular disease risk factors, subclinical cardiovascular disease, and hard cardiovascular disease events, let's discuss the evolving epidemiology of adverse pregnancy outcomes and the potential drivers so we can try to understand what the current state of affairs is. So we talked a little bit about the potential short-term maternal morbidity and mortality, specifically thinking about ICU stay, mortality, and adverse pregnancy outcomes all together. And you know, we know that maternal mortality in the United States is among the highest in all high-income countries. And these are data from 2018. And unfortunately, this number has now increased with the latest statistics from 2020, exceeding 22 um, per 100,000 births. What's even more compelling is that greater than 80% of these deaths are preventable and cardiovascular disease is a leading cause based on maternal mortality review committees. The other thing that's really important to understand as we think about maternal deaths and particularly cardiovascular deaths is the timing of when they occur. While about a third of these occur in that first week postpartum, specifically related to hypertensive disorders or pregnancy, about a third occur in that seven to 42 day postpartum, but more importantly, a third occur late, so 43 to a year postpartum. And again, the majority of these are preventable and a leading cause is cardiovascular disease. If we look at absolute numbers, and I pulled these numbers from 2019, kind of pre-COVID, which have only gotten worse in the current COVID era, we see that nearly 300,000 births in the United States every year are affected by hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, about 50,000 by maternal morbidity, 10,000 by eclampsia, and um, about nearly 800 um, deaths that occur every year. So this is, an, in absolute numbers, a, a very big problem, but also in relative numbers, this is changing and increasing. So shown here are data from the National Center for Health Statistics from 2007 to 2019. And what we see are the H standardized rates for new onset hypertensive disorders, which includes preeclampsia and gestational hypertension. Um, and we see significant increases over this period. Preterm birth, which had stabilized to some extent or was declining, hit an inflection point in about 2014, 
when hypertensive disorders was increasing and was primarily driven by increases in hypertensive disorders of pregnancy and is now increasing as well. In addition, there are significant disparities with the highest rates among non-Hispanic Black pregnant individuals, and that disparity is not narrowing over time. We see similar patterns for increases in gestational diabetes with the highest rate of gestational diabetes among non-Hispanic Asian groups. But I think one thing that was really important to try to dissect out when we try to understand who is most affected by gestational diabetes was looking at disaggregated Asian subgroups. And you can see Asian Indians are among the highest um, who experience gestational diabetes, very similar to type two diabetes. Again, demonstrating that overlap in cardiometabolic risk between complications during pregnancy and outside of pregnancy. We see similar patterns among disaggregated Hispanic subgroups as well, highlighting the importance of better understanding racial and ethnic identity uh, as we better understand where these trends are going. In addition to that, place-based disparities are continuing to persist. We looked at rural-urban disparities in both pre-pregnancy hypertension in the first panel, as well as new onset hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. And in both, you see that rural individuals have a much higher risk for hypertension, either prior to pregnancy or during pregnancy. So we're seeing these worsening trends over the past decade. And the automatic question is, why is this happening? And oftentimes, one of the potential drivers that's considered is, the, is maternal age. And we know that maternal age distribution at delivery has increased over the past decade and has increased by about two years, primarily driven actually by a decline in teenage pregnancies with some increases in uh, pregnancies 30 to 39 um, and relatively flat in the 40 to 44 year period. But if we look at the absolute numbers, and this is the distribution of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy over that entire time period by age group, you'll see in that teal and purple, about 50% of cases are occurring in 20 to 29 year olds. So individuals who you wouldn't think are necessarily at increased risk for hypertensive disorders or pregnancy based on their age alone. Now, age is of course an important relative risk factor for pregnancy complications. It doesn't take away from that, but the majority of births are happening in this younger age group. So by absolute numbers, we need to think about other things that are changing these patterns and trends as well. And it suggests that there may be other contributors, so secular trends, period effects, or potentially even generational effects. And that was the question we wanted to better understand with this analysis, which was using a method called age period cohort analysis to try to dissect out what are the contributions of age that are leading to the changing trends, period, or the year of delivery, as well as generation. So the year that the pregnant person themselves were born. And if we think about particularly in the last several decades, kind of the onset of the obesity epidemic in that generation that has lived through the 80s and 90s, particularly in younger and younger generations, of course, since then, that becomes a really relevant and important question as we see these increasing trends. So in that first panel, what you see is that of course on the x-axis by older age groups, there's higher rates of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. But then for each younger generation, that rate is higher for any given age group. That's I think important because other than changes potentially in diagnosis, awareness, this might also point to the fact that we're seeing more cases at any given age group now based on the generation of the individual who's pregnant, not just when they're delivering. In the second panel, we also wanted to ask the question whether or not these generational effects are different by self-identified race and ethnicity. And you can see based on these curves that are rate ratios comparing younger generations to those born in the 50s, that there's overall similar patterns with the highest rate ratios for Hispanic individuals showing the greatest increase generationally over time. So now that we've talked about the adverse trends that we're seeing, as well as the importance of adverse pregnancy outcomes for cardiovascular health, let's talk a little bit about the rationale for promotion and what potential opportunities may exist to intervene in the peripartum period. So we know that pregnancy and postpartum are an important time period for cardiovascular health, 
but really they're primed by the pre-pregnancy period. And the upstream driver in many of these complications is preconception cardiovascular health. This can often be a challenging area to understand because many individuals don't have pre-pregnancy care or routine medical care before they become pregnant, but is really important if we want to think about interventions that will have the greatest impact, not just for the pregnancy itself, but for long-term cardiovascular health. So if we look from birth certificate data at the relationship between pre-pregnancy cardiovascular health and adverse pregnancy outcomes defined here as requiring ICU admission during delivery, preterm birth, or low birth weight, and grade cardiovascular health based on four risk factors, so smoking status, obesity or overweight, hypertension or diabetes, we see this graded response for, so with each um, worse cardiovascular risk profile where a cardiovascular health score of zero means all four risk factors are present, we see this graded increase with nearly a three to six fold higher risk of adverse pregnancy outcomes if any one of those or if all of those risk factors were present. Now, whether cardiovascular health is measured pre-pregnancy or during pregnancy, we see similar graded relationships. This is a study from the HAPO study, which was a multinational study that recruited about 2,300 women at a mean gestational age of 28 weeks and looked at the relationship between cardiovascular health metrics um, shown in the green bars, all ideal, and then again, greater than or equal to too poor in the red bar where you see the highest rates of preeclampsia as well as other obstetric and fetal complications like unplanned C-section, high or low birth weight, um, excess adiposity and cord insulin sensitivity. Now, cardiovascular health during pregnancy is not a unique concept. And if we think about studies from life course epidemiology, we know that cardiovascular health declines over time as we get older. But in this really nice analysis that pooled multiple cohorts um, from Europe and the United States, including cardiovascular risk in young fins, the Bogalusa Heart Study, Project Heartbeat, um, the Special Turku Coronary Risk Factor Inter Intervention Project, and the Coronary Artery Risk Development in Young Adults, I'd like to point your attention that even though they looked at ages 8 to 55, that a lot of that decline is happening in these reproductive years. These are prime years when individuals are transitioning from childhood and adolescent to young adulthood and independence and lots of different things that are happening, but also during that reproductive time period where we're seeing decline and identifying a key period in the life course that interventions are needed. Unfortunately, from a, a population and public health standpoint, we also know that this is a group that we're seeing worse than cardiovascular health in, in terms of obesity, hypertension, prediabetes and diabetes, all risk factors, not just for adverse pregnancy outcomes, but also long-term cardiovascular disease. Coming into pregnancy, we see very similar patterns as well. So, and this is consistent from any age group. So it's not just that we're seeing this in older individuals who are getting pregnant, as you can see, 15 to 24, 25 to 34, and 35 to 44, we see a decline in optimal cardiovascular health coming into pregnancy, again, defined by the absence of smoking, normal BMI, no hypertension or diabetes, which is probably a generous definition of optimal cardiovascular health as there may be subclinical changes and risk factors even among these individuals. We also see significant disparities by social disparity, um, social factors, particularly as represented by WIC enrollment as a surrogate factor for social disadvantage. But importantly, there's declines happening in all groups. And so we're really not seeing any narrowing of disparities either. Now this kind of sets up the perfect storm in terms of this increasing burden of maternal morbidity and mortality in the United States. We're seeing worsening pre-pregnancy cardiovascular health, increasing pregnancy-related risk, and that's really leading to these adverse trends that we're seeing in adverse pregnancy outcomes, maternal morbidity and mortality, as well as potentially onset of premature cardiovascular disease after these complications. So I posit that maternal morbidity, which where we've been focusing a lot of our attention is really just the tip of the iceberg. And that's potentially when we're seeing problems that have really surpassed where we should be identifying and intervening. And that 
what we really need to do is expand our focus to include the promotion of cardiovascular health throughout the peripartum period and think about health beyond disease. Now, this isn't a new idea. This is something that ACC, AHA, and ACOG have have published on, um, particularly in the 2019 Primary Prevention of Cardiovascular Disease um, gui Guideline Recommendations, where preeclampsia and adverse pregnancy outcomes were identified as a risk-enhancing factor. In the AHA and ACOG Presidential Advisory, there was an emphasis placed on risk identification and cardiovascular health promotion during these reproductive years. But oftentimes, the challenge becomes, well, how do we do this, and what do we do to implement this? And I think this is where we need to think a little more broadly about cardiovascular health promotion as being not just the absence of disease. We all know what the thresholds for treatment are for risk factors, and often in this age group, they're higher. For hypertension, we're not going to see an ASCVD risk of 10% or greater in these young individuals, but potentially there may be subclinical elevations in blood pressure that need further attention and need more intensive preventive efforts to really get into that optimal health. And I think this sets up a window of opportunity where we need to be doing more so that people don't progress. And this is true for prehypertension as well as dysglycemia that may be picked up, particularly among those who have gestational diabetes. What do we know about postpartum interventions to mitigate cardiovascular disease risk? So if we think about that window of opportunity, what are the health systems that are in place for that? Well, there aren't very many standardized or evidence-based ones. This was a really nice review that was published um, a couple of years ago in JAMA Cardiology that outlined a potential role for transitional clinics that may be able to operate in that peripartum, postpartum period where there needs to be a handoff from the obstetric provider to a primary care clinician, and often where that handoff is missed and the individuals are lost to follow up. And so potentially could a targeted clinic be a way to ensure that individuals get a referral and that this focuses on education and counseling, thinking about screening and risk assessment, particularly for those who are high risk and they get referred to specialty care, medication management, connecting with primary care clinicians, and identifying a workflow that ensures that there isn't loss to follow up. Specifically, what are the screening recommendations? This was an opinion piece that was published in circulation a couple of years ago, trying to highlight the importance of this care handoff and the fourth trimester for assessment of cardiovascular disease risk factors, um, specifically after an adverse pregnancy outcome. So thinking about blood pressure, BMI, lifestyle counseling, um, particularly in that six week period, but also extending out and thinking about in the six month period and the one year period annually, um, but set up an important question of how often should these risk factors be checked and what is the evidence behind checking and intervening in this young adult period. And so it really is a gap in the guidelines among individuals with a history of adverse pregnancy outcomes where we think about what we should be doing for them. And so the, um, the current recommendations for cardiovascular risk assessment focus on adults 40 to 75 years. And if we think back to some of the data we saw where coronary athro is already present, CAC is already developing by the time that individuals are hitting 40 who, um, who are postpartum and have had adverse pregnancy outcomes, well, that's probably maybe we're getting them too late. Maybe they've already developed hypertension. And some of the studies, about 50 to 60% of individuals had hypertension by the time they were 10 years postpartum, so in their late 30s. Um, and so we're missing that opportunity. And that last recommendation in terms of the use of preeclampsia or hypertensive disorders of pregnancy as a risk enhancing factor is helpful or useful for statin considerations as well as guiding blood pressure lowering targets, but doesn't help us identify risk earlier. In terms of lifetime risk assessment in that 20 to 39 year period, we don't incorporate adverse pregnancy outcomes into that assessment. Um, with the recommendation to assess risk factors at least every four to six years, which I would suggest is probably too few in between for someone who's already identified as high cardiovascular risk, who has had a hypertensive disorder, who has had gestational diabetes. Many expert consensus recommendations suggest annual checks, 
but these aren't things that necessarily are reimbursed, covered, or evidence-based, and so there continues to be a gap in understanding and how often we should be doing these checks, but also when we should be intervening. And if we look specifically at the available and compare the available guidelines from ACCAHA, which I've outlined here, as well as USPSTF or ACOG, we continue to see that there's very little guidance provided not only for sex-specific recommendations in general, but specifically for individuals who haven't had an adverse pregnancy outcome where long time periods in between that might be sufficient for young adults that have not had a complication are probably insufficient for these individuals. ACOG has very clear recommendations about that early postpartum period, but not regarding long-term cardiovascular risk screening. In... Um, in this uh, Jack's state of the art review, we tried to put together some of these expert recommendations in terms of what should be considered for individuals in the 20 to 39 year range. This was work led by Neil Stone at Northwestern trying to identify a workflow and algorithm in an area where there continues to be gaps in evidence and how we can identify individuals who are, either have subclinical elevations and risk factors, who have risk factors and consideration for earlier intervention. Those are all perfect and idealistic recommendations to think about in a world where everyone had access to healthcare, but we know that's not the case and particularly vulnerable are individuals in that postpartum period who may lose coverage. Um, this was a recent study in JAMA Health Forum that looked at a survey conducted by the Centers for Disease Control, um, the Pregnancy Reporting and Monitoring System, or PRAMS, and looked at individuals that received even a postpartum visit who came to their postpartum visit, as well as received counseling, um, the second bar there, existing standards being on depression counseling and contraception counseling, and the third bar being on cardiovascular health counseling related to postpartum weight retention, exercise, um, and smoking cessation. And you can see there are significant um, disparities based on insurance carrier, based on rural urban status, based on racial and ethnic groups, but also in the overall sample, just very, very few reporting, all recommended counseling received. Now, one of the big changes that um, has been in, uh, currently going into play has been the um, extension of Medicaid coverage postpartum up to 12 months. And see here, Georgia um, did extend to the 12 month period, which is great for those individuals who were often churning on and off insurance with Medicaid in the postpartum period, trying to get individuals coverage to be able to get in and get postpartum visit to be able to get follow-up and monitoring for some of these services. But they're still pretty limited coverage, about half of states have not yet instituted, I think about 22 states have not yet instituted this coverage. So suggest that there continues to be a large gap in coverage for individuals who are postpartum and at risk. This is particularly important because we know that upstream social determinants of health play an important role, not just in per the peripartum period, but throughout the life course and are a fundamental cause of health inequity and driver of structural and systemic racism that we see manifest in earlier onset of disease, more severe disease through a variety of mechanisms. I think this is especially important when we're thinking about adverse pregnancy outcomes and peripartum complications, because we're not just thinking about the pregnant individual themselves and their postpartum care, but also the child and the offspring. And this is a schematic um, that's based on David Barker's developmental origins of health and disease, really identifying the, those fetal life exposures. So if a uh, a child is more likely to have experienced an adverse intrauterine environment related to stress, related to adverse pregnancy outcomes, they're already on a trajectory with higher cardiovascular disease risk throughout their life course. And so really with no intervention, that may mean higher risk of cardiovascular disease earlier in their life, as well um, as further risk during their life if those same social factors are relevant in their um, experience as well. With intervention during pregnancy, this could potentially alter the trajectory, ideally with pre-pregnancy intervention where all individuals are able to enter pregnancy with optimal cardiovascular health and 
and lead to um, better pregnancy outcomes, we could see the best outcome for the offspring as well. These are data that help support that hypothesis. So the first study is from that HAPO study we saw um, earlier looking at cardiovascular health and pregnancy complications. And in this study, what they looked at among the mother and child dyads after the children had grown up to be 10 to 14 years. And so they wanted to compare cardiovascular health from that pregnancy measurement at about 28 weeks. And that's shown on the x-axis where all ideal metrics are in that dark pink box and what the adolescents' cardiovascular health, me health metrics were at 10 to 14. And you can see those individuals where the pregnancy cardiovascular health was optimal or ideal were much more likely to have offspring, have ideal cardiovascular health. And this was persistent even after adjustment for pregnancy complications, adjustment for social factors, adjustment for shared environmental factors. So really a kind of significant finding in terms of that potential for intergenerational health transfer. We looked at preterm birth patterns and demonstrate the significant disparities in preterm birth between non-Hispanic Black individuals and other race and ethnic groups in the United States. And shown here are data from a European cohort that looked at the relationship between preterm delivery with gradations by gestational age at delivery and offspring risk of heart failure. And you can see those individuals that were born preterm had a much higher risk of developing heart failure, even in their early 20s and 30s. So again, really highlighting the importance of that intrauterine environment and pregnancy complications in offspring outcomes. Now, this is important because if we're talking about how important those upstream social drivers are for pre-pregnancy cardiovascular health and pregnancy complications, well, this really sets up throughout every stage of pre-pregnancy, pregnancy, postpartum, and in the offspring's later life, a fundamental cause of health inequity across generations that requires targeting at every stage of the peripartum period to not only optimize cardiovascular health for the pregnant individual, but also for future generations. So what are potential solutions? I think these are things that we need to start thinking about on multiple levels, specifically across those timeframes before conception, during pregnancy and postpartum. We think broadly, such as federal and state level policies, we talked a little bit about postpartum Medicaid extension, smoking bans are another idea where we could see reduction in cardiovascular risk on a population level, community engaged interventions, barbershop and church-based interventions have been documented to be highly effective in hypertension management. Could they similarly be used for postpartum individuals? Health system interventions, remote blood pressure monitoring programs, particularly in that postpartum period when individuals are most vulnerable and also may not be able to come in and out of the um, health system with a small child without childcare or if they have to return to work without um, maternity leave or coverage, paid maternity leave. And then on an individual level, are there other things that we can be thinking about? Nudges, audits, poly pills, and thinking about disruptive solutions for problems that have been persistent for a very long time that are uniquely affecting individuals in the peripartum period. These are things that um, we're hopefully continuing to make progress for. These are two funded efforts through NHLBI, through the Enrich program or the Early Intervention to Promote Cardiovascular Health of Mothers and Children, where we're a clinical center um, part uh, partnering with home federal home visiting programs such as Healthy Families America and partners its teachers to try to deliver cardiovascular health intervention materials in that peripartum period and the Health Equity Research Network and Maternal Infant Health Outcomes that's led by Alan Tita at UAB. So I'd like to conclude here and um, hopefully we have um, some time for questions about really thinking about the cardiovascular health in the peripartum period and focusing in on that pre-pregnancy, postpartum period and the young adult period and identifying this as really a time that we can prioritize as a window of opportunity when risk for cardiovascular disease is being unmasked. Second, we demonstrated that the decline in cardiovascular health is likely a major driver of these adverse trends and adverse pregnancy outcomes, particularly in those younger generations with persistent racial and ethnic disparities. And lastly, shifting away from focusing exclusively on maternal morbidity, just a disease state to maternal cardiovascular health promotion and thinking about health in a more positive way in the peripartum period 
is necessary to achieve not just health equity, but intergenerational health equity. Thank you so much for your time and attention and happy to take questions. Um, you know, you sort of showed the social ecological model and this idea that we have to think about this as sort of a multi-level framework. And I wonder, um, you know, obviously extending Medicaid for 12 months is sort of one solution, but certainly is not going to solve the entire problem, which is massive. And then if you think about sort of the political landscape now with kind of this recent role grab on reproductive rights, I think that there's been evidence from Texas and other places where um, decreasing women's access to abortion has, has sort of had a more blanket effect on just access to reproductive care as a whole. Is there any data to kind of model or predict what we might expect based on sort of recent policy changes in terms of women's access and how this may impact maternal morbidity and mortality? Yeah, no, I think that's a, a great question and definitely seen some early data showing that there have been increases in um, maternal morbidity related to decreased access. And you can imagine that individuals who need that access often because of high cardiovascular risk are overlapping with the same individuals that have high social risk and high needs. And so I, I think that is going to be a driver in seeing worse trends, but not just worse trends, but disproportionately affecting individuals that are already disadvantaged. So, so thanks so much. That was really, uh, really interesting. I, I'm struck by, uh, you know, the, the, you, you addressed this in, in the talk, but, you know, you have the, the sort of pre-pregnancy period where you're just not in contact with women. You have the pregnancy period where you're in contact with them very regularly, but you're entirely focused. You, the, the tendency is to be focused on something very different and probably reluctance to start medical therapy that is more forward looking. And then, you know, we lose people, right? They, 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 sort, of, they sort of fade. And, and the early postpartum period, as you, as you mentioned, is one that's just so hard to get people um, into medical care because there are so many competing considerations and complexities. So I guess I'm curious from your perspective, and you did, a, I, I thought, a really nice job sort of laying out potential interventions at any given spot. And I recognize there's no magic bullet here. But if, if you were sort of to pick one sort of intervention, where, where do you think our biggest bang for our buck is going to be in terms of trying to make a difference in this? Yeah, no, I, it's definitely a question that we have been debating for the last several months as part of the Enrich Network to say, you know, we have a limited time frame of access to individuals both in the pregnancy and postpartum period, because even within home visiting programs, so that's like one of the best situations because they are engaged with a program where they're getting access to care through community health workers and we're able to reach them, but there's still time constraints and limitations in how much you can deliver. I think the number one risk factor is obesity, but it is a very, very hard thing to change and modify. The, the thing that I think will give us the most greatest bang for our buck is modifying blood pressure. And if we, if I had to pick one risk factor that we could intervene upon, whether it's dietary lifestyle medication, which it may be, or we have safe, effective medications, it would be blood pressure. I think the, the knowledge gap is how low should we be going in young people after a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy? I was going to ask Neil's question. So I'll ask another one. Um, <laughs> It's a good question. So has anybody done twin studies? I mean, there may be too much concordance among twins, but it seems like that might be a helpful strategy to sort out sort of uh, some of the genetic, you know, predisposition versus all the other environmental factors. Yeah, in terms of the relationship between um, preterm birth and some of these later life outcomes for the offspring, there have been some twin studies um, out of Sweden and looking specifically at the relationship between earlier gestational age and um, cardiovascular disease, it, they seem to be consistent. So there's definitely something about whether it's epigenetic modification of the inner uterine environment or genetic factors that are linking um, these adverse pregnancy outcomes and later life cardiovascular disease. In terms of preeclampsia and the risk itself for adverse pregnancy outcomes, there are um, GWAS that have identified specific potential genetic contributors. 
it seems like the magnitude of the um, association related to genetic factors is just so much smaller than traditional risk factors where there's a lot more impact and probably what's driving what we're seeing in terms of adverse trends. <laughs> I have another thought. Um, you know, from a systems level perspective, as you've mentioned, it seems like again it's so difficult to capture these women in the postpartum period because there's just so many competing interests, right? With the young baby at home, I mean, it's really hard. Um, are there any models that sort of, I mean, if you think of this concept of like a hub and a spoke, it almost seems easier to place an internist or a cardiologist in the OB practice rather than asking women to come to us in a totally separate healthcare setting. Does that exist in any form that you're aware of? I think Pitt has a really great collaborative program where the cardiologist and MFM see the patient together after the postpartum visit and they do remote blood pressure monitoring, but it's really hard to coordinate within health systems and there's a lot of pushback. I think some of what we've seen during COVID suggests that maybe some of this is really better set up for remote monitoring. And there are obviously challenges with reimbursement and how to set that up as well. But if what we really need to know is how their blood pressure is doing and following that, can we do that without the added visit and set that up in a way that would allow us to keep their blood pressure under control? Because that's the leading reason for postpartum readmission. Thanks, Dad. That's great. Um, I've asked this question before, and I always it always comes to my mind when I see that graph of why United States has such high mortality compared to other countries. What do you think we need to do differently now? Like, is it, is it something, is it physician driven or is it more societal factors, insurance? You know, is there something that we should be doing? Because I know in terms of cardiology community, we have been talking to OBGYN um, uh, you know, OB uh, and also primary care, you know, lots of education. But is there, I, I still don't understand what the factors are, why it's so much higher here compared to France or some of these other, you know, European countries. Yeah, no, I think there's a lot of different potential and it's probably not just one thing, but health insurance coverage universally seems to be one of the primary drivers because oftentimes people are coming into pregnancy where half of pregnancies are unintended. And so there hasn't been any care, any primary care prior to that um, initial prenatal visit. And a lot of the interventions that have been trialed during pregnancy have not been effective at reducing adverse pregnancy outcomes, which suggests it may be too little too late once someone is pregnant. You know, we can definitely monitor people. We need to identify people better. We need to make sure that we pick up when there's um, an adverse pregnancy outcome occurring and manage it appropriately. But to actually prevent it, we have to start earlier. And that requires having access to care. So I think the societal issues around that, the ability to access care, I mean, I think Alana pointed out just having Medicaid coverage isn't enough. You have to know where you can go to get care, who's going to accept your insurance, because it's not like Medicaid's accepted everywhere. Even if you do get Medicaid, what your deductible will be, what your out-of-pocket will be. And there's enough barriers that even just having insurance isn't enough. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.